Thank you everyone for coming. This is on Baby on Board Battle of o uh, Over Pregnancy and it's the end of the private or public morality strand that's been happening in this room today. Um, and why, uh, I guess, you know, maybe why is pregnancy in a private and public uh, morality strand? But um, when I was thinking about the issues over pregnancy and when people are saying, well, you know, Increasingly, it seems that our autonomy is being undermined and our own decisions are being undermined and how it's being undermined. My feeling was, well, actually, there is one state already when um, autonomy is very much under question and personal autonomy, and that is in pregnancy um, at the moment and, and the, the sight of the pregnant woman. And um, really, literally, every week there is uh, an article in the paper, I think this week it was, uh, that women shouldn't have uh, drink water out of plastic bottles and shouldn't heat things up in plastic containers. I mean, it is a, a relentless um, news uh, that comes out uh, dictating to pregnant women what they should and shouldn't do. And so I just thought it was a very interesting topic to look at. Why is that? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, and what has uh, happened to create that? Um, we were going to have four speakers, but unfortunately, my fourth speaker <laughs> seems not to have arrived. But uh, we have three excellent speakers anyway, and hopefully, then gives you more of a chance to talk um, from the audience anyway. So we will. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers. Um, they'll speak for about six to seven minutes. Uh, hopefully, that will generate some questions that I can ask them. Then I will go out to you, and hopefully, it is a topic that you'll all be interested in and ask great questions. The session is sponsored by the Parents Forum, which is a forum I run, which looks at um, the whole issue of parenting, policy, uh, books about parenting, just really investigating why it has become such a hot topic uh, in these days when it used to be very much uh, an issue behind closed doors. So we're really looking at why has it suddenly become an issue very much in uh, you know, an open forum. So uh, I'll introduce the speakers in the order in which they're speaking. So the first person is Deborah Bick, and Deborah is a Professor of Evidence-Based Midwifery Practice at King's College London and Editor-in-Chief of Midwifery, so uh, thank you Deborah for coming. The second speaker will be Linda Geddes. Uh, Linda Geddes is a reporter for the New Scientist and author of Bumpology, the Myth-Busting Pregnancy Book for Curious Parents to Be, and that's in foils, and uh, Linda is happy to sign a copy for you, <laughs> and in fact how I uh, first heard of Linda, my uh, sister who's you know, just recently had her baby, said to me, oh, this is a really brilliant book, and uh, of all the pregnancy books I've read, this is, you know, the most intelligent and assuring to me, and, uh, and has been a, a, a great comfort for me <laughs> to me to read. So, um, that's, uh, thank you, Linda, for coming. And then, thirdly, uh, but not least, of course, is Jenny Bristow, who is a writer on parenting culture and intergenerational relations. Yep. She's author of Standing Up to Super Nanny, which has a forward by me, and I hope it is in the bookshop. Also, Jenny... Uh, will be happy to sign, and co-author of Licence to Hug, um, which is about the vetting and, and how uh, that affects us, and that's apparently on Kindle, available on your Kindle now, uh, and uh, the social cost of litigation. So uh, I guess with no more ado, Deborah Ogle. Good afternoon, delighted to be here. As a midwife, my role when caring for pregnant and postnatal women and their families is to be an advocate and promoter of appropriate care and advice to ensure every woman and her baby remain as healthy as possible, physically and mentally, when they start their new lives together. This has been the midwife's role for centuries, when pregnancy and birth were considered women's work, birth took place in the home, and medical care, if it was needed, was not considered absolutely necessary until the woman's labour became obstructed. In the last 50 years, there's been an enormous shift in pregnancy and birth care, and today in the UK, giving birth is as safe as it's ever been. Maternal deaths in the UK are thankfully very rare as a consequence of improvements in public health, better nutrition, access to contraception, medical advances, including introduction of antibiotics and improvements in anaesthesia. So given that this is the case, why is pregnancy so monitored and a woman's lifestyle placed under increasing scrutiny? 
I want to stress that we've actually not got a very good record of involving women in decisions about their care and obstetrics. The battle over pregnancy is not a modern phenomenon. The current monitoring of pregnancy is, in my opinion, the legacy of the medicalisation of birth in the UK and assumption of the type of intervention women need to make their pregnancy and birth safe. Unfortunately, many of the interventions assumed to be of benefit were not evidence-based and most completely ignored women's autonomy and the importance of social and psychological factors to a woman's well-being. For example, place of birth was moved from home to hospital on the assumption of safety. All women were subject to routine perineal shaving and enemas when they went into labour, as if being in labour wasn't enough, and routine episiotomy to expedite the birth of the baby. We forced women to be recumbent in labour, we timed the duration of breastfeeding from each breast to 10 minutes, and separated mums and babies on the postnatal wards because we assumed it would prevent infection. At one time, we were even using x-rays to determine the size of the woman's pelvis, the radiation exposure not deemed at the time to be harmful to the woman or her baby. And I could go on, and uh, those of you familiar with the Cochrane collaboration um, may be aware that Archie Cochrane actually would award obstetrics the wooden spoon for the lack of evidence we had to support practice. So going on from that, we actually have very good policy at the moment, which does support women's autonomy for birth in the UK, Choice is high on the agenda for women and it emphasises that health providers place women at the centre of any decisions about their care. But unfortunately, I think evidence and policy implementation are not a priority in a service which is currently close to meltdown in some parts of the country, particularly in London, due to cuts in service provision, a shortage of midwives, an increase in the birth rate and complexity of the health needs of women who become pregnant today. We're also seeing increased centralisation of our maternity units. All of us working in the NHS have to follow guidance from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or, or NICE to give it the acronym, which informs NHS care at the woman's first antenatal booking. Midwives are expected to ask every woman who books in pregnancy about her history of mental health, her medical history and her current and previous pregnancy history. The woman will be weighed and her BMI calculated. We screen for social problems, for example, history of domestic violence, alcohol or drug abuse, which women may uh, require additional social support to counter. These are really important issues for women and their babies in families and the shorter and the longer term. But the problem is that many of the screening interventions don't have robust evidence of the best way to identify problems in the first place or the best way of how to manage problems if they are identified. Furthermore, we have a situation where screening interventions, which may improve outcomes in a very small proportion of our population, are applied universally, putting women in a position of having to prove that they and their pregnancy are normal. Alongside the shift in the focus of antenatal screening, which has moved from the woman to the fetus, our definition of what is normal or low risk has altered exponentially. The terms normal pregnancy, normal labour and low risk are subject to any number of caveats with a constant drive to standardise pregnancy outcomes to fit a specific model of care, trigger intervention and provide a benchmark for comparison of outcomes. If a woman doesn't fall within our definition of normal, she's at risk, based on a population statistic and managed as such regardless of her individual health status or history. One other contributing factor to change in our approach to pregnancy is our ability to now see into the pregnant womb. Nearly every pregnant woman giving birth in the UK will have at least one ultrasound scan, an intervention that again was introduced on the assumption that it was safe. The development of ultrasound has provided greater opportunity for clinicians to conduct detailed monitoring of the developing foetus, and few women refuse the opportunity to have a picture of their baby in, in utero. However, ultrasound is another form of screening, and findings can also present women and their partners with extremely difficult choices if problems with their baby are identified an aspect of ultrasound use that women may not anticipate or be aware of. So the debate we're having today is more important than ever. As research and technology develop, pregnant women in the future will undoubtedly be subject to a whole new array of emerging screening interventions based on biomarkers to predict risk of developing severe conditions in pregnancy, such as preeclampsia. It always strikes me as ironic that despite our focus on the promotion of positive lifestyle choices in pregnancy, it's after the birth that women, I think, really do become invisible. Health problems such as depression, anxiety and other mental health problems are ignored and don't disappear within the six-week postnatal period. 
We seem more or less to abandon women once the baby is born and make no further reference to lifestyle. Pregnant women should make lifestyle decisions without policy interference, but many at the moment are totally confused by the information they are subjected to at a time when they feel vulnerable and exposed. I want to stress that no guideline from government or the medical profession are meant to be strict. They are guidelines, and in many cases, the recommendations presented are based on best guess, not robust evidence. And NHS clinicians need to be clear about this. We often don't know how an intervention will affect an individual woman's pregnancy outcome in the shorter or longer term. And in these circumstances, who are we to say that we know what's best for the woman and her unborn baby? I don't want to sorry, just five cents. I don't want to exp uh, women to experience a modern version of confinement by adhering to very every edict about what they may or may not do during their pregnancy and what may or may not happen if they don't comply with official advice. It may not be appropriate for the woman, for her baby, and it could lead to un unexpected outcomes. A woman constantly anxious and worried about her pregnancy who doesn't feel her views are represented is not likely to experience a very positive start of parenthood. So, in my opinion, the battle line of a pregnancy needs to be redrawn. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for inviting me. Having had two babies in the past three years, I can assure you it's tough. Quite apart from the nausea, the heartburn, the swollen ankles, the varicose veins, and the constant pummeling from within, practically every aspect of your life becomes cause for concern. Pregnant women mustn't eat too much because it might raise the baby's risk of future obesity or diabetes, but they mustn't diet because in some circumstances that might have a similar effect. And they mustn't exercise because that might trigger miscarriage, apparently. Um, you know, it's enough to raise your blood pressure just thinking about it, and you mustn't get stressed because that's also bad for the baby. Um, neither are you allowed to have a glass of wine or go to the spa to relax, and even lying down in bed can prompt fears of cutting off the baby's blood supply. When I found myself pregnant for the first time three years ago, I felt this overwhelming sense of bombardment and anxiety. It wasn't just coming from the media, although that's a big part of it, um, but from doctors, antenatal teachers, friends, and even complete strangers who thought it was perfectly acceptable to wade in and ask if it was okay for me to be having a glass of wine in a restaurant, or whether I should really be carrying a suitcase up a flight of stairs in my condition. Earlier this year, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists published a paper suggesting that pregnant women should avoid contact with a slew of everyday household and beauty products, from moisturiser and shower gel to pet shampoo, all that new furniture that you've just bought for the nursery and paint fumes, on little, if any, evidence. The rationale was it's better to be safe than sorry. Um, but the downside to all this is that it's actually really stressful for a pregnant woman. I think pregnancy leaves women uniquely vulnerable because they, even if they've got a scientific background like I have, they've never done any of this before and they're you know, they've been handed sole responsibility for this little person and they're really worried about them. They're not irresponsible. They care about this baby that's growing inside of them. And society just heaps guilt on them. And just as uh, Deborah said, you know, as soon as you've had your baby, that wrapping up in cotton wool vanishes and no one asks whether it's safe for you to be driving home with your baby or whether you've childproofed your house or whether you're even appropriate parents. No one asks that. And it also means that as pregnant women, we're often quite at the mercy of the advice that's given to us uh, by antenatal teachers, by doctors, by midwives, which is fine, except that some of them haven't been trained to understand risk in the scientific context. And some of them, unfortunately, do let their own personal beliefs contaminate what they preach to pregnant women. Shortly after I started to write my book, Bumpology, which was prompted by all of this bombardment, I got pregnant with my second child, Max, and I began to re revisit a lot of what I'd been told the first time around, by, particularly by my, uh, my NCT teacher, so I did um, antenatal classes with the National Childbirth Trust. And I realised that a lot of what my teacher had told me was misleading, and some of it was even wrong. Um, so first time around, the birth plan I wrote stated that I absolutely did not want an epidural or a C-section unless it was an absolute medical necessity. I was terrified of doctors, I was kind of terrified of the hospital um, because I'd been told that basically they wanted to get, get at me with their knives. Um, I had this fantasy of having this beautiful water birth and that I could just, you know, if I just tried hard enough I could manage my pain using hypnosis and it, would all, it was all going to be fine. Um, and then labour happened and I felt completely unprepared for the reality of what was actually happening to me. Um, 
So, you know, I, I was scared. And the reason was that my antenatal teacher had told me that if I had an epidural, it would increase my risk of tearing, which sounded absolutely horrible. And it would also boost my risk of needing a C-section, which also sounded awful because I'd been told that if I have a C-section, I'm going to be stuck in the hospital for, you know, at least a week. And it's going to decrease the risk of me bonding with my baby and I probably won't be able to breastfeed if I have a C-section. So that sounded like, you know, I don't want to have a C-section or um, I don't want to have an epidural. And the trouble was that when I started looking into it, a lot of this was inaccurate. So I'd been made to feel very worried about this and made decisions about the kind of labour I wanted based on inaccurate evidence. So although there is a, an increased risk of needing an instrumental delivery, which is one involving forceps or a vacuum device called a Vontuse, if you have an epidural, the absolute risk, which is the one you need to worry about, is actually very small indeed. So 20 women roughly would need to have an epidural for there to be one extra instrumental delivery to take place. And the risks with C-sections are also often overhyped. So there's not really any direct evidence that it reduces bonding between mum and baby. And while it's true that women who deliver by C-section are less likely to breastfeed, a lot of this is because traditionally women were separated from their babies straight after birth if they delivered by C-section. And we're increasingly realising that skin-to-skin -skin contact is very important in stimulating a woman's milk supply. And I also felt quite shortchanged by antenatal teachers who glossed over some of the uncomfortable truths about birth, like it hurts, and that roughly 85% of women giving birth for the first time will tear to some degree, and while just around 35% of women anticipate suffering severe pain, actually more like 65% experience it. And, um, and also after birth, you know, when, you're, when your milk comes in, if you're breastfeeding, actually your breasts will become so hot and swollen that you'll wonder what on earth's happening to your body and if someone's snuck in in the night and replaced your breasts with a sack of boulders. And, and actually all of this is completely normal and this is, you should be expecting this, it's, it's perfectly fine. I don't want to scare pregnant women, but I do think we need to have greater honesty about what labour entails and to give women honest facts, to let them make their own decisions about the kind of birth they want to have and also to have some realistic expectations so they don't feel guilty if they don't achieve this fantasy birth that they've been dreaming of. And finally, I just think it's time for society to reflect on the effect that all this bombardment with advice, judgment and scaremongering has on pregnant women and new parents and to consider slacking off a bit because having, baby can, having a baby can be one of the greatest joys that life gives you. And uh, at the same time, it's extremely hard work. And I think women and new parents can do without any unnecessary anxiety, guilt, and doubt. Please. <laughs> I, I do apologize. I work on a Saturday, so and I got stuck. Um, so just, just to get to the nub of it, are women bossed about in pregnancy? Yes. Are they infantilized? Yes. Uh, obstetrics, it seems to me, by definition, is about interfering. Um, and especially with midwives who are, on the whole, absolutely excellent and are not, are not allowed to do what they want to do. Um, pregnancy makes women feel incredibly self-conscious because, you know, hey, they get bigger. So Kate Winslet, for example, now has gone from being in the Titanic to being the Titanic, according to the Daily Mail. Um, all of which I know Jenny will go into, and, and do we need as many experts as we've got? No, we don't. But I'm sure Jenny's going to go into that in great detail, well, in some detail. So I just want to focus very, very quickly on three areas. One is the hypocrisy, um, which has um, made maternity completely masochistic exercise most of the time, but actually looks, which, and, and very personal, so it puts an enormous amount of individual responsibility on a woman, but actually doesn't look at the wider political context in which she is pregnant. I want to look at the, well, that's what I call the fetalocracy, if I can get it out, fetalocracy, which means that the fetus gets an enormous amount of tension, but actually nobody stops to say, is this the, is this the, is this the best thing for, for that future baby, if you like. Um, and there are other priorities as well. And then the third thing is just the commodification of pregnancy, how, how the womb has become an extension of the property market. And, you know, you can rent a womb, and some wombs are actually probably slightly larger than some of the bed, bed sitters that you can get in London. But anyway, um, it's, 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 uh, it's very, very um, 
I think it's very dangerous that how quickly the, the commodification of, of pregnancy is happening at the expense of very poor women who are doing, who are doing the, if you like, the renting the wombs uh, through surrogacy and other means of re reproduction. So just to go back to the hypocrisy, um, I find it really weird that you have all these experts giving advice, and I, I'm, and I exclude Deborah, but you know a lot of experts giving advice, when at the same time benefits are being cut, housing is rubbish, young women, teenage women, women in their 20s have next to nothing during maternity now to live on. So it seems to me that if you're genuinely interested in having happy, uh, healthy babies, that should be part of the uh, equation. Um, I think the, the fetalocracy, I went to a very interesting conference of, about medical ethics uh, by the Royal College of Paediatrics, and um, one of the things that they talked about was the capacity they have now to intervene in the, in the womb. So, for example, babies are quite often now born, born with something called Edward syndrome, which I don't know if you know what it is, but um, normally they would have died within days. Now they can keep them alive, even up to the age of 10, but with a huge number. I mean, 50% might do reasonably okay, but the majority will actually have heart disease, lung disease, bone disease, uh, be educationally challenged, have a whole series of, of, of illnesses that demand continual intervention, and that's somehow seen as a medical miracle. So I just think there should be more debate about about uh, about about um, the fetus. There's also, of course, the abortion debate in America, where I, I was, had the pleasure of listening uh, to. It shows you how hard I work uh, to share in work uh, on Women's Hour, um, talking about how the, 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 some of the states are imposing ridiculous uh, uh, regulations on abortion clinics, such as you have to have. The, the, a lavatory 25 yards away from wherever anybody's being examined, which means that most of them cannot afford to go to continue because they're on very small um, amounts of funding. So I think I think the way in which the fetus is actually pushing it, is literally pushing itself forward, is something to be looked at. And then the last thing is 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 the commodification of pregnancy, which is quite extraordinary. So you can now have a situation that when a child says, "Where did I come from, mummy?" It's a very complicated answer because you can actually have eggs. Um, you can have French eggs, you can have an Austrian sperm donor, you can have uh, an Asian woman lending her womb and out pops the baby and, you know, I don't know whose it is, it's a sort of, I mean, of course if it's love, that's fine, but, it, but this, is, this, is about, uh, this is about a marketplace and it's a marketplace without many rules and it's not always satisfactory, I think, for quite a lot of the people involved, particularly those on, uh, on, on, who, are, who are forced, really, for financial reasons to, do, to offer their, their bodies. Um, as incubators, so it's more of a, not so much maternity, more a gestation period. And if anybody can remember the case of Mary Beth Whitehead in 1985, with baby, baby M then, with baby Melissa, she uh, was paid $10,000 uh, $10, by the Stern, a uh, couple called the Sterns, uh, if she went to term, and $1,000 if she, if she miscarried. And then when the baby came out, obviously she felt hugely conflicted, but because property comes first, a judge eventually decided that this, the baby, regardless of the fact that her mother had breastfed her for 40 days and wanted to hold, keep hold of her. Property uh, uh, comes first, and so the baby was handed over to the Stearns uh, with some visiting rights eventually. But I think all these issues are, are, um, are you know, areas of concern that don't seem to be debated so much because we're so focused on, um, on the marketplace that pregnancies become. So you have the whole industry, the high street industry of you know, certain clothes, people having their photographs taken, you know, nine months pregnant with nothing on, I, all of which is, is, is fine, but to me it seems a, a major distraction. And in terms of the, you know, should you, how much should you drink, whether you should, you know, should you sniff plastic, should you not eat cream cheese, um, I, I abide by what Mae West said, that you only live once, and if you do it right, that once is enough. So I think you should just do what you want to do and use your common sense and enjoy as much as you can the pregnant the labor i mean i can't remember the labor now but i do vaguely i had a few twinges when when joe was talking but uh, uh that's all i want to say thank you <laughs> thank you and jen um i remember when i first read about the the so-called surrogacy farms in india um, this is the the rent wound thing that I yvonne's talking about and and i remember reading this article the kind of horrified fascination um, this is a phenomenon where women are paid to incubate the embryo and the fetus um, in um, parts of India for, they're being paid by richer couples, usually uh, ones from um, the West. And they're called surrogacy farms because these women are kind of kept in confinement, I mean physical confine, confinement, for the, the duration of the pregnancy to ensure that they are properly nourished and looked after and, and cared for 
for the sake, not their own benefit, but um, for the, the sake of providing this kind of optimal womb environment for the child. And um, since reading about this, I, I, I confess I've tended to use this sort of example as a, um, a sort of a chilling warning metaphor um, of the, uh, the, the way that pregnant women in Britain are, are policed uh, during pregnancy. Um, I've sort of tended to use it as kind of like handmaid's tale sort of dystopian vision. Look, this is the, uh, the logical consequence um, of this, this pregnancy culture, which it, it increasingly seeks to um, intervene upon the pregnant women's decisions in every area of her life. Um, and their women's diet, behaviour, and also their feelings are increasingly scripted by this notion that what really matters is that you have this optimal womb environment. I have heard it actually talked about like that um, by um, IVF clinicians, for example, who very clinically say, this is what we want, the optimal womb environment. However, I was sort of thinking about this, and I've actually come to the conclusion that the impact of Britain's pregnancy culture is in fact worse than uh, Indian surrogacy farms, and, and here's why. Um, I don't want to hijack this into a debate about the rights and wrongs of commercial surrogacy, actually, because I think that's a very complex issue um, and would take up a lot of time. But I think what you can argue from, uh, from that debate is, and, you know, women who, so, well, some of, the, some of the women who participate in this um, do argue that the decision to be a commercial surrogate is a clear-sighted, practical decision where, as a woman, you decide to relinquish personal freedom and control over your body for the sake of money to benefit your existing family and your children. And yeah, women I've seen interviewed express this very, very clearly. They're doing this for nine months, uh, voluntarily and temporarily. You know, it's a, it's a contract. They do it for nine months and then they go back to their lives with the money this involves. Now, obviously that's not the whole story. There are a lot of uh, inequalities, both social and global, involved in it. But it's, a, see, it's very much discussed in, in, in one form in a very kind of clear transactional way. In Britain, by contrast, I don't think there's anything voluntary or temporary about the new confinement that all the panel have talked about in, uh, in one way or another. I think you choose to be pregnant, um, but the fact that these days you tend to choose to be pregnant um, is seen as sort of de facto acceptance that you um, have chosen to submit to the myriad rules about how you will, uh, about what you'll eat, you know, how much you will drink, like nothing, I think the, the new orthodoxy is, and even how you'll feel. Um, Linda talked about how uh, maternal stress is now considered, I mean, this is, this is so ironic, this discussion. Anyway, all these bossy people who keep telling women what to do now say maternal stress is the biggest problem in pregnancy, it's really, really dangerous, worse than smoking, because no one smokes in pregnancy anymore. Um, so, yeah, stress is the biggest factor, and, you know, th this comes from everywhere. This is a culture that I don't think it just comes from doctors. Um, it comes from midwives, it comes from the government, it comes from the NCT, as, as Linda said, it comes from strangers in the street who will just sort of wander up and say, you know, well, should you really be doing that? And I think, you know, you can choose to be pregnant, but you can't choose to opt out of this, this pregnancy culture once you're in it. Um, and so it's a very sort of insidious um, thing. So it's not voluntary, and it's not temporary either. The reason for uh, why women are supposed to submit to uh, good behaviour during pregnancy is that, um, and the way it's justified now, is that the effects of uh, one's behaviour in pregnancy apparently last forever. Um, it's now really, um, the orthodoxy is that for the child, your behaviour in pregnancy uh, will have a lifelong effect. The effects of that glass of wine or those feelings of anxiety will work themselves into the child's brain or genes or something and irreparably uh, change and transform you know, how that child is within the womb. So whatever you do now will have a lifelong effect um, throughout the whole of that, that, that child's existence. Um, and yeah, this, I think, this notion that you have this kind of imprint upon the fetus through you know, various kind of chemical ingestions during pregnancy, I think really represents a very bleak and deterministic idea of what shapes a new human being. Um, I really do think that babies are more than uh, the, the whatever goes into them by the womb. And when they come out of the womb, there's a lot that can be done with them. You know, and this sort of notion that it is all shaped by the womb, I think, is, is really very kind of bleak and disturbing. It also has a very interesting effect on social policy because, of course, if, if it's all determined in the womb, then social policy needs to then be directed around policing pregnant women because what's the point afterwards? It's like you might as well give up on the kid once it's born. But um, 
I also think getting women to submit to rules in pregnancy, these particular rules, is explicitly posed as a marker for the kind of parent she will be. And again, this is a forever thing. Um, I don't actually agree that it all stops once you've had the baby. I think, you know, new mums are increasingly surveyed, monitored, bossed around. You know, and it's almost like pregnancy becomes the way of getting used to that fact that you are no longer a person anymore. You know, you've got to kind of put, put your child first is, is, is what's said. Now, when women might decide that they want to put their child first, fine. I don't think this kind of stuff is, is genuinely child-focused. I think it's all really about um, obedience. So I want to end by suggesting that, um, actually, I think you don't get the perfect parent through um, good pregnancy behaviour or ideal pregnancy behaviour. I think the kind of parent that's trained through this kind of policing of pregnancy makes for the worst kind of parent of all. Because what I think matters to a child far more than whether you eat pate or cheese or wine or stress or whatever, is having a parent with their own sense of autonomy and the ability to make decisions and stand up for herself and her child and her family against the bureaucrats and super nannies who will always presume to know better. I think all of you have mentioned, in a way, um, scientific advance versus maternal haptic experience, in a sense. And um, So I just would like to hear, again, you know, really examine that a bit more from the panel, because there does seem to be a thing, perhaps, that scientific advance would be a good thing. I mean, Debbie, you're saying, well, obviously, uh, you know, the thing of uh, prenatal deaths now, and, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's so successful, and you think, well, that, you know, science seems to have been a good thing, but, uh, you know, Yvonne, as you're saying, increasingly the sort of ability to look and uh, see the foetus and, and the screening, etc., does actually seem to present the foetus as a separate person to them. You know, everyone rushes and sees their picture now of their baby in the womb and, and almost as a, it does seem to be a, a separate uh, person. So, you know, is science good? Is science bad in relationship to that? Has it gone too far? And is that explaining why, uh, you know, there is this bombardment? Is it from a scientific basis? Um, how do we balance that? So really, do, I mean, because all of you thought so I'm but Yvonne, I don't know whether you want to start. Uh, I think it's about it's about it's about moderation. I think the inter interesting thing is that science is doing this, whether we like it or not. It's just ploughing on without any kind of wider public debate of any kind. And neuroscience has become the sort of black magic of of the 21st century. That almost everything, um, when in doubt, mention neuroscience. I, and I do this in leaders as well, so I'm as guilty as anybody else. But you know, when in doubt, mention neuroscience, and suddenly. Um, uh, you know, it seems to have an authority. I think the thing about scans, scanning, for example, I had my children very, well, relatively late. I had one at 36 and one at 46. And when I was pregnant at 46, I eventually abandoned the hospital because they wanted to scan me all the time. Now, I didn't feel that was actually a benefit to me or my child to be, but, but a baby to mother to, what am I, am I a mother to be? It's a child, is it a child to be? Anyway. <laughs> um, to be born, I think they're reluctant. Yeah. Um, uh, and, I, and I subsequently, when I asked, it, I, it was because they were interested for research purposes. Nobody asked me whether I would be willing to take part in any kind of research study. Um, and I, I thought that was pretty typical, really, of the way in which um, mothers are sort of excluded as if they're too immature to be part of this wider discussion about what should or shouldn't happen. And yet they have a valuable, they are the experts, you know. I mean, I can't think of anybody more expert than somebody if they've had a fair deal in life. Um, who knows something about their about their um, body? So, of course, I think um, um, Deborah probably would, would say this. I don't know. I'll, I'll look forward to hearing. But young women, you know, 15, 16, 17, do need a different kind of support. But even they are very capable. I mean, quite often, um, especially in, in Britain, they come from several generations of women who have had teenage pregnancies, who again probably know as much, if not more, than than the doctors who are bossing them about. And there is something, it, you know. Advice given in a particular way is one thing. This very paternalistic kind of uh, patriarchal way that, um, it, that many, many women get spoken to uh, is just not acceptable. And whether or not that's associated with science in, 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 uh, and the fetus, it, it, it's something that should be challenged much more. Thank you. Thanks. And I think the point I was trying to make was that, you know, we, ha we have all this technology, all this science, and, you know, if, if we have the kit, we will use it, you know, sort of to borrow the Monty Python, you know, yeah. machines that go ping. Um, and I suppose what I was trying to get at was the point that we really don't know, we haven't made a huge advantage in a lot of our outcomes as a result of science. 
Our improvements in maternal mortality have been probably more of a public health consequence than anything mm. else. There's an awful lot about labour and birth. We still don't really know how it happens. You know, it, it, it happens and, uh, you know... And the scanning, I mean, you know, very cynically, um, you know, my perspective is that's actually just another bit of income generation for the hospital. Mm. You know, women are paying for their scan photos and you can buy videos and go to sort of see private uh, physicians who will charge you £200 for vid your 3D mm. or 4D video of your baby. Um, and, you know, we're not making that much of an outcome as a result of all this, this science. We're just, I think, confusing women where, you know, pregnancy, uh, you know, is a captured audience almost for researchers because, you know, women are coming routinely mm. through our doors for, for scans, for checks, or whatever. Um, and I think it is really important that as clinicians, you know, we don't become across as bullying women through the use of scientific terms and, and technology because it's not appropriate. Um, and I think... You know, I have to say, with the respect to things like scan, I think in my practice I was only ever challenged by one woman on one occasion who said, do I really need a scan? Because women are so desperate to see their babies and they get a little bit upset if they come back to clinic and you say, well, actually, you don't need a scan today. It's not, you know, it's, it's not needed and, you know... Um, so it's, it's a very... And more and more women, particularly in London, I don't know if it's just a London thing, perhaps others will tell me, more and more women are using NHS services but also going to see private obstetricians because they want these detailed mm. scans, they want to get closer to their baby in utero. Um, and just to really, really emphasise, we don't know whether this is safe or not. Mm. You know, we, we scanning, as I say, was introduced en masse. It was actually developed from, I think, in the, on submarines, wasn't it, to detect sort of yeah, you know, well, problems yeah. with metal and things. Um, you know, so as I say, we have this situation, and, and unfortunately it's very difficult, you know, once people have developed tests, developed technology, it's very difficult to say, stop, you know, we're not, this is not appropriate. Um, and I think, you know, the things I quoted earlier that we used to do routinely to women, that when they actually looked had no evidence of benefit and actually were potentially more harmful, a lot of those things were stopped because the women themselves started to question why it was necessary. Um, and certainly as a midwife researcher, you know, more and more of our work has to be informed by what the women think are the priority topics that we need to look at. And, uh, you know, much more of those are around the way we talk to people, the communication, the information needs, not the sort of scientific <laughs> machinery or drugs or whatever that we have access to. Well, I think, I mean, I'm a science journalist, so <laughs> I kind of make my living from writing stories about scientific advances. Um, two things. So one, one is that I think science can be quite useful in unpicking some of the myths that have grown up around pregnancy. So things like exercise during pregnancy... This, was, this largely came about because obstetricians just thought it seems reasonable to assume that going running when you're pregnant is a bad idea. They didn't have any evidence for it, they just thought, seems like a bad idea, we'll tell women not to do it. And then as more research has been done, we're starting to realise that actually exercise in pregnancy is probably quite a good thing. Um, there was a really interesting piece of research recently which involved, it was, it's American research, and it involves putting pregnant women on a treadmill wiring them up, you know, intensively monitoring them and their babies and getting them to run, getting them to run until they're, you know, until they're so tired they can't run anymore. And all the while looking at what's happening to their babies, whether the baby is being deprived of oxygen, which was the main concern, whether the baby was moving about, what was happening. What they found was that the baby was bouncing about a lot, you know, it was moving around, having a kind of workout itself, but it wasn't, it wasn't being deprived of oxygen, it was, it was perfectly fine. So I think I think it is important to do research to answer some of these unanswered questions and to counter some of the myth. But then I think the problem is in the way it's reported. So I think the media, even though I'm part of the media and part of the science media, I think journalists have... I think there's a problem in that uh, newspapers want to sell newspapers and um, headlines about pregnancy do tend to sell papers. And... Um, and often the things that generate headlines are quite scaremongery stories... They might be research done in a very small number of women or research in animals or research that you can't necessarily really make a judgment as a pregnant woman about whether or not you should do that thing. Um, and then that kind of goes out into the ether and then, you know, there's never, a, there's never another newspaper article to say, oh, that thing we wrote last week about um, bottles and plastic and water actually... There's some more research that says water and plastic is fine because that's not a really seductive uh, story to read. Um, so in terms of... And I think that also filters through to antenatal teachers and to midwives and to doctors, you know. 
Um, my, so my husband's also a science journalist, and he used to work at the Telegraph, and I think he wrote a story once about, um, this isn't about pregnancy, this is about fertility and sperm, and he was working, it was a, it was a story about how um, if you work with a laptop on your lap, then it's going to decrease your sperm count, and he wrote, a, he wrote a story about this, and it was published in the Telegraph, and I think it was quite a slow news day when he wrote it. And, um, and then, uh, he, then later he was writing a story for New Scientist about, um, about sperm counts and things and he went to get his he went off to have his sperm analyzed and stuff and the doctor said the doctor the doctor actually said to him um you know well you know if you want to maximize your sperm count you know you shouldn't be using a laptop and he said why why and they said oh you know he said what's the evidence for that and i think the doctor actually said oh you know if you read the newspapers that so so doctors actually get some of their their opinions from newspapers as well so i think we need to kind of treat what we read in the newspapers with a lot of, and probably in the pages of New Scientist, with a lot of uh, scepticism. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I'm not really sure how much any of this is about the science at all. I think it's more of a cl clash of values that borrows on the authority of science. And then everyone's playing the same game because everyone ultimately wants to tell pregnant women what to do. I mean, I think the, the best example of this is actually the, um, Deborah was alluding to, the great... Um, clash between obstetrics and midwives that took place in the 60s and 70s, where you had you know, this kind of norm of highly scientised, medicalised um, births, which, as Deborah rightly says, you know, there was a lot of evidence for a lot of it, and then a reaction against that by the natural birth lobby that you know, said, well, actually, women need control over their bodies, they should have control over birth, blah, 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 you know, which I've got a lot of sympathy for as it goes. But if you look at the way in which the, the language of natural birth and everything that goes with it, natural birth and breastfeeding and, you know, skin to skin, as you mentioned, has been sort of co-opted and promoted and presented in this scientific way, it becomes every bit as bullying as the, um, you yeah, know, the old-fashioned doctors in the white coats. And so I just find it, um, that, that, that's what I find kind of really unsettling about the whole discussion, that there's this notion that the pregnant woman's body is, you know, it's it's public. It's not it's not private anymore. It is a public space for people to have their own kind of values clash, you know, on that on that terrain. And I don't think it's really about technology either. I think I've read some quite interesting studies about. Um, I think this is in the context of I suppose we've been going through IVF or women's relationship with ultrasound, where I think it is a genuinely a two sided thing. I think women have you know on the one hand can find. You know, scanning and monitoring very intrusive um, in the way that's been suggested. But they also can find it empowering as well, in the sense that, you know, technology can tell us certain things. I don't think it's just because they want to meet their babies. I think because that technology exists, women want to know if, you know, if the fetus is all right. The fact that we know this stuff now means, you know, there is some, something you can do about it, potentially. Um, not perfect, but you can, you know, so I think there's a, I think we just have to be careful about kind of, um, the old divisions, really, between obstetrics and midwifery or between, you know, patriarchy and feminism. I mean, I think everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet and it makes it very hard to be pregnant. Hi, uh, my name is Josephine. I'm, I write for The F Word. It's a feminist, uh, contemporary feminist website. Um, one of the things is I also have a science background. And uh, one of the things that I'm a little... Like, we, we talk about this debate about, uh, well, like, we, we, we should just go on our own... Um, you know, our own intuitions, or like, well, like we, like they're like, it's a good thing to follow science in the sense that um, if there's not enough evidence, then science will tell us there's not enough evidence. But at the same time, I don't think we're actually talking about perhaps the um, the the political the the gender politi po politicalism of science. So, for instance, like how many women are becoming scientists? Like, what what are the blocks in this area? Like, what is being researched out there? Are they coming from a woman informed area? So, for instance, we we I, we see lots of studies of like drugs being tested, and then say like, okay, everyone, you know, you take two pills of this, and it will do this to you. And it's like actually a lot of these studies are like most of the volunteers that go in are men, and then they realize they have completely different side effects for women. Or this issue about how, um, um, I, like, when I first started studying science and, and gender and feminism, it's like there actually is very little information about the the egg and about women, uh, about how, how does it go, and like there's this whole notion that the egg is passive and it just kind of floats along into the, 
and then it gets, oh, there's like this sperm that's very active and that comes and it's like actually this whole story about the egg and the sperm is actually also informed by um, gender and this issue. And it's like, part of me wonders is like, yes, we should rely on science and we should think about it and we should really come at it in an evidence-informed area, but how much of this science is still informed by gender patriarchy? In the discussion on neuroscience that I was in in the last session, one of the speakers uh, made the point that we no longer have a family unit, uh, in a sense, but it, 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 would, it seems like uh, parents and children um, are seen as uh, individuals with separate interests uh, rather than um, a family unit as a whole, and it really does seem that the whole discussion around pregnancy really feeds into that, where the fetus is entirely separate almost from the woman who's carrying uh, the fetus around and it's seen to have um, entirely separate interests which then kind of brings this um, ability I suppose for anyone to uh, act then on behalf of the fetus but then um, it seems women also do like there is something about that um, whole thing that women also uh, like so the baby on board um, stickers that you put on or um, you know, on the one hand I think pregnant women get annoyed when people say should you be having that glass of wine and they might have made a decision that they could have a glass of wine and, and they get annoyed by that and then on the other hand there is a kind of uh, something special about being able to be an important pregnant uh, woman who can display their stickers on the tube can expect people to stand up for them and has a status as someone who is carrying uh, this uh, important um, fetus that's going to be a, a new child. And I just wondered if you could uh, say a little bit about that, because it does um, seem that there's a kind of uh, contradiction sometimes in the way um, women uh, respond to this. And is it just the kind of specialness, which you should be special you're in a sense when you're pregnant that's a not that can be a nice thing but then does is the price that we're paying almost for that too too high yeah I mean I think that is an interesting question women do seem to be embracing this I mean I'm shocked you know so it was 11 years ago when I had uh, my last child and you just you know now any woman at my work is pregnant they really do not eat things they really do not drink things they really you know sort of go into this monastic uh, <coughs> situation and as this is a discussion about autonomy you do think well these are grown women surely they can go sod you right you know I will have that glass of water but but you know so I just think that's really interesting one level you can you know we're going well you know here all these autonomous you know women and I don't think you need to be a scientist to to, to 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 be that and yet they you know there does seem to be this complete across the board cohort so you know so I'd be interested in what the panel said about this and, and I think the other thing that interests me is is there a strong moral point and I think this is perhaps what Jenny's saying because it's a bit like you know in a world where we can't agree on much it does seem to be that every, everyone can agree that a pregnant woman shouldn't have a glass of wine and, and you know because again why the you know women now try and go into a bar have a little glass of wine and people literally will not serve them or look at them with moral opprobrium and you know I presume people could, I could be doing all sorts of other stuff and people feel very frightened to uh, create a moral condemnation around that. You know, it, 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 this does seem to, again, be a relatively cohering force. So, so is there a moral dimension as a sign from a scientific dimension as well? So, Jen? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, first of all, I, I, just on your point, I don't think it's male science. I think this is a real misnomer in this discussion. Um, and if you want to look at how um, really the, the, the kind of scientization of moral values has developed, you need to look at the breastfeeding debate, the, the so-called science around breastfeeding, of which there isn't all that much, certainly not in terms of determining you know, your child's outcomes. But this is you know, just promoted by everybody to justify a position which is basically a, a values position that women should breastfeed their children, you know, and, and with everything that's bound up by. So, you know, I, I really don't think there's a conspiracy of blokes out there. I actually think blokes are often a lot more sensible on all of this stuff than women. Um, and, you know, that includes the women that you meet in the park or in the bar when you're not drinking a glass of wine. You know, I mean, they're horrible. And, you know, it's like so much for the sisterhood. Anyway, um, 
I mean, in terms of the, uh, um, the, the point about sort of identity and, and all of that, I mean, I think people should be nice to pregnant women, okay, and new mothers. Um, I just think they should be. And I think if you're a pregnant woman, it is quite difficult in the 21st century because on the one hand, you, you know, you've chosen your pregnancy, you're going to work, you're doing all of this stuff, you know, life is normal. And I suspect that partly what goes on is people think, you know, hold on a minute, I want people to recognise that I'm actually pregnant as well as doing all of this other stuff. And, you know, but the only way in which it's now possible, seem apparently possible, to be nice to pregnant women is seem to be bossing them around. I mean, it's just bizarre. Like, you've got to wear a sticker that says, be nice to me, I'm pregnant. You know, why aren't people just nice to pregnant women? Or why is sort of supporting new mothers seem to be you know, by not letting them drink wine? Or if you're the dad, the most supportive thing you can do is to stop smoking yourself. No, the most supportive thing you can do is to make her a cup of tea. You know, I mean, it's just like the, the whole thing is so bizarre, it seems to me. It's just gone into this realm of abstraction, which I think is where it leads to this whole kind of scientization thing. It's a sort of an abstract discussion of really what is a very kind of straightforward and um, social, personal, you know, often intimate thing of, you know, how a culture <coughs> looks at and nurtures um, a woman who is carrying the next generation. The baby on board stickers thing, I, I, find, I mean, I was, I've been pregnant in the last few years and I live in London and I never had a baby on board sticker <coughs> Mostly because I didn't want to define myself as a pregnant woman and label myself as a, a pregnant woman because I was trying, like, desperately grasping onto my um, my sense of identity and I didn't, I didn't want to become a mother. I wanted to carry on as normal and be a mother as well. Um, but then I can also empathise with women who wear them because people in London are horrible. They are. You get on the tube when you're obviously like 38 weeks pregnant and people like sit there with deliberately with their books going. No, I'm not going to look at the pregnant woman because then I have to lose my seat. They, you know, they are horrible. So in a way, I think it's actually just a way of initiating a conversation with people on the tube to say, no, I, am, I really am pregnant. I really do need to sit down now. Please let me sit down. Um, I was just going to answer, go back to your question about, about science. I do, I mean, I do, I do think that there are some areas of pregnancy research that should be done that maybe aren't done just because there aren't enough male research, uh, enough it's largely male researchers and they're not thinking about things and the main one is morning sickness you know it, I really no one still really understands what causes morning sickness they have ideas but no one's really got it and it doesn't really seem like anyone's trying to get it either even though you know some women have such bad morning sickness like Kate Middleton that they're hospitalized and they have to be wired up to a drip to get enough fluid um, and I don't understand why research isn't been doing in, done into areas like that and then I had a, a funny anecdote about eggs actually and about eggs not being a passive well it's not about eggs not being passive it's about actually some recent re interesting recent research about actually the uterus choosing which um, which embryos it wants to implant so actually the the womb actually has a lot of say over whether it wants to have a pregnancy or not and whether it likes that particular um, embryo or not. Thanks. Um, yeah, I thought it was an interesting question about the sort of gender bit. And um, as a mother of identical twins, one of my daughters is here now, probably really embarrassing her, but my husband was absolutely <laughs> delighted when the news came out that potentially the egg split due to the strength of the sperm, which he thought was... <laughs> <laughs> and again, we don't know why it happened. So um, it's interesting. I mean, as, as a midwife, obviously, you know, I, I you know, want to advise women about breastfeeding, but, you know, I've also worked with NICE to make sure that we include information for women who don't want to breastfeed because we shouldn't make women who don't want to breastfeed feel guilty. Um, I didn't breastfeed. I had, I had identical twins and I had to go back to work really quickly and I deliberately chose not to breastfeed. I knew the other, I knew, you know, so, and um, having two intelligent daughters, you know, it, it's, it's a very complex and I think it's all to do with the culture of the country and all sorts of other things as to why we don't do particularly well in breastfeeding compared to other countries. Um, with respect to sort of, you know, treatment of pregnant women, um, I would like to think we do nurture pregnant women, but obviously people have, you know, experiences where they've not been well looked after, they've not been sort of given the support they need. Um, and, it, and it may be, I mean, it's interesting, that my area of interest is really care post-birth. And, you know, if you go back a few years, we used to have traditions and cultures in this country in terms of women being churched at 40 days post-birth, and, the, you know, this period of rest post-birth where women didn't, 
take on employment and they, they, they stayed in the home. And it's, it's interesting because women, in, in some ways, perhaps we're our own worst enemies because we've tried to drop those sorts of things to prove that we are straight back to being normal. And I've certainly discharged women from the postnatal wards who were desperately trying to get back into their genes to go home in, you know, despite the fact they've had nine months of pregnancy. So I think we, we've lost the plot somewhere. Um, you know, we need to go back and nurture women. We need to make sure that the dads, the partners are engaged and, and, and fully contributing and, and knowing how much their input is appreciated. And I know as a midwife, uh, you know, I'm probably very guilty of just saying to the father in the delivery room, if you faint at the crucial stage, we'll just step over you, you know, and not engaging. And so, you know, we, we have still got some very basic common sense. And I think that it's possibly, you know, we've, Yvonne mentioned, we've lost our common sense in some ways. And that's what I would like to bring back to the debate, that a lot of this stuff is not what women really want. It's not what their partners really want. And we've just lost our way a little bit, I think. Uh, it, it, it is, is it gendered? Absolutely, definitely. Um, I think we need to go right back to, to, not quite back to Adam, because that's a bit too far, but you know, de definitely go back and look at the whole thing again. I mean, in my lifetime, you know, women came in, they had their pubic hair shaved, they were told to lie flat on their back, they were preferably told to have it between Monday and Friday, because all the do male doctors were off playing golf at the weekends. Um, they were pumped full of, ex of laxatives, because the doctors didn't want anything nasty happening. Uh, they were made to feel like they were they were they were children, not fully grown women. I think in terms of um, epidurals, and I don't know if this is apocryphal, but I was told that epidurals were never properly uh, trialled. So they have, they have been now in terms of type of epidural, in terms of um, mobile, which has got a lower anaesthetic dose, but they weren't. So you know, I, I very much doubt millions of men would have had a big needle stuck in their backbone if it hadn't been well and truly tried for, trialled first. Uh, and lots of women I know who have had ep epidurals complain bitterly of, of back pain and so on and so forth. So I do think we need to have a look and I think we do need to encourage more women into science. And um, in terms of a baby on board, I think it's deeply depressing that in the 21st century, when women have been in the workplace for over 40 years in great numbers, we are still seeing women being sacked in pregnancy. We are still saying, the very fact you said um, uh, it's, it, uh, it, um, it's important being a pregnant woman. I mean, that, that means that um, women who, who are in the paid workforce have to pass, as Deborah was saying, as if they're actually not nine months pregnant. They have to pretend that they're not feeling any of the symptoms they, they feel. Um, and they go straight back to work too soon. Um, I mean, I'm very glad, actually, that some women are now having a, a year's maternity leave. I think that takes great confidence, and it's actually what the system should do because if you don't have pregnant women and if you don't have women having babies then capitalism doesn't have any future customers so it doesn't seem to me to be too bad a deal really um, and in terms of pregnant where, where, where pregnancy is now and how women want to be made a fuss of really it reminds me a bit of of, of the menopause in the 1950s and 60s when women were so sidelined from life that when they had the menopause some women not all women some women M made it a kind of lifelong mission to have a, a lot of the symptoms because that was the only way they would get any attention. So I think I think what we're in the middle of is cultural change as well as 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 as, as a need to incorporate women in all their phases of life much more firmly in the workplace without uh, re requiring retribution. On the, uh, the baby on board stickers and about it being about people in London being horrible. I mean, I live in London too, and I, my experience is absolutely not that. Mm -hmm. That actually, and especially now, men are desperate to jump up. Men and women yeah, are, no, it is are, men who are, get, it is men desperate who to jump, get jump up and give people seats. <laughs> I think there's a horrible kind of guilt that they might be missing something. And in fact, I've had men jumping up <laughs> for me recently, and I'm thinking, do they think I'm pregnant? Do they think I'm old? What is it? Well, actually, they're just being quite nice. That's <laughs> fine. Thank you. I'll take the seat. Thank you. Um, uh, who knows? Um, on the choice thing, we were talking about how women have more choice. Somebody said that earlier. Have more choice today. I don't. I don't think that is true at all. And I think there's a big pretense around what choice is. My again, personal experience is being told, you know, you can create your own birthing plan, but when I actually said I want an epidural, they said that's not a birthing plan, you can't choose that option, that's not the right choice. So I think with the, the, the natural childbirth and the breastfeeding, I can't imagine how bad it is now, that was, you know, 10 years ago that that happened to be, it must be way worse now for women who actually don't want to suffer any pain. Um, and I just, um, one of the things that Jenny was talking about earlier that I really agree with about 
um, the, the, the the temporary nature, I can't remember, uh, what, what, what was it? Uh, basically, all of the information that we get when, when, when women are pregnant, it definitely doesn't stop. And I think it's interesting, I've, I've been um, kind of watching a, um, a group on Facebook, sort of um, uh, a parenting group who, um, you know, and it's supposed to be about offering mutual support. And I, what I've noticed is that now, there's a lot of pregnant um, women asking questions about, you know, or any recommendations about local doctors, any recommendations about, you know, should I be eating the cheese or not, and what kind of buggy should I get in preparation, you know, that supports the back, you know, for the, of the baby, but it doesn't stop. And I think then when the child is born, the questions, the, the, the lack of um, kind of self-belief in parents now, it, you know, it, it comes from those very questions that are raised in pregnancy and that I think is what is terrifying that we've got uh, you know we're going to have generations of parents who can't make decisions or unable to make decisions about their own private families because of what's happening during the pregnancy phase. Uh, no it's not really a question more sort of an observation yeah, is that um, um, to can you say that relativize with you know the role of science is that um, uh, I'm from the Netherlands my wife is from France and we live in Brussels but you can see that even though science crosses borders, of course, um, that um, the advice you get uh, by experts is not, it's, com it's com completely different in, uh, depending on which country you live in. And so we, you know, that's what we notice, the cultural difference between us. Um, because, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, um, many women, uh, they give birth at home. And uh, for instance, for the, for the family of my, my uh, wife, in France, it was sort of barbarism, and even though these experts they they, they know the same they they know the same uh, research results, and um, well, there are more examples. Like I think um, the number of um, what's the English word? Um, you know, when you see the image of the baby on the screen, or what's it called? I forget. Yes. Scan. Yes. Um, uh, the number of scans is in certain countries it's limited. I think uh, in Netherlands it's only like two times or something like that. And in Brussels, I was uh, astonished because my wife is pregnant now for a second child. The number of, of scans we, we get now it's good, mm. seems to me completely ridiculous. Um, so, you know, just, just a thought that um, in, in different yeah. Western European countries you can have a completely different uh, way that. Uh, this is treated. I just wanted to ask about the programs like One Born Every Minute. It's like this attempt to like normalize birth, but then when you watch the program, everything's all about this kind of magical journey that women go through, which to me just looks fucking awful. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> it is, you know, you have the man there who's like, Oh, you're doing you're doing brilliantly and obviously he's just wanting to turn an arm and just be like, When's this gonna be over? <laughs> it just looks terrible. So like what what <laughs> What, what are the impact of these programs on like the way that we uh, now think about pregnancy and think about um, the birth itself? Hi, my name's Mike and uh, my wife and I are expecting a baby at the moment and I think my wife has endured pretty much the full range of what you have described from friends, colleagues, uh, the media and um, probably from me as well until I was told to shut it. Um, <laughs> and I think it there is a definite cultural thing here but I, I would say my own experience, I think that the NHS has a sort of role in this, um, in offering kind of impartial but risk-based advice makes it quite difficult, I think, for parents to think clearly about issues when they're so, or parents-to-be, when they're so emotionally invested in something and obviously becoming very risk-averse. And I wonder if there's anything about the way that the NHS itself offers this kind of risk advice, this kind of uh, the huge reams of stuff that is available to parents online uh, that would make people would allow people to make more considered uh, judgments about risk about that would reduce some of the anxiety around the issues of uh, you know, the health of your unborn child. Um, certainly, I know that when I speak to gynaecologists who are friends, they give pretty robust uh, and down to earth advice, but that doesn't really come across when you read. The NHS literature is very different in tone. Mm. I'd be interested in your thoughts. It doesn't seem to me in the workplace that women on uh, maternity leave and coming back to work are very 
uh, disprivileged Yvonne for me. I mean, you're right, both the years uh, maternity leave, and in fact, you know, there is a whole raft of legislation around, uh, you know, choosing to come back part time and stuff. And actually, most employers right, is, do, do yeah, um, take on that. So, so you it, end up you end up parked in a cul-de-sac. Possibly, but I mean, you know, it, 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 as you admitted, there is a, an improvement in that sense from the 60s and 70s. So, um, but that's just perhaps an ob observation. Um, obviously, what the thing about the anxiety, and, and if we make uh, people so anxious in pregnancy, which which does seem to be this assault, then how do you, as parent, does that carry over uh, as a parent, and 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 is that problematic? Um, which I think was interesting. I mean, obviously, there is a cult, you know, are we just talking about a British cultural experience? And actually, you know, is that just a very, if you like, narrow and parochial? It's important to us, I guess, but not ex how that's happening um, across developed countries. Um, I think that really interesting that there does seem to be this public aspect of pregnancy now, where there is one born every minute. You know, I know several women who are pregnant who've been asked by various. Uh, new uh, channels, you know, there seems to be multiple of these programmes now in which pregnancy is, it does seem to be this public face of pregnancy again, where p ironically pregnancy does seem to be <coughs> a much more public arena and, and of interest and what does that mean and, you know, I, I guess I think the uh, gentleman at the back and, and Linda, whether that feeds into your point, whether well, is there a sort of division between the elite who really know the risks and the, the sort of information which becomes propaganda perhaps or where you know what is information what is propaganda in relationship uh, to the pregnant woman you know there's a few in the know and the rest are told what to do so Yvonne through. Um, I agree actually I think people are very friendly in, in in London and I also see quite a few pregnant women knocking booze back and uh, you know nobody going up there and whipping the glass away so um, there's hope for us all yet um, um, I think it's quite extraordinary, again, really, that the way in which maternity services have been designed almost have no relationship to what women really want. So, again, it goes back to your question about, about gender. It's, it's very much a management approach to how you have a baby. So if you... This, this is sort of an answer to all those questions, really, I hope, that if you actually started with the woman and actually saw her as a, as a woman with her own individual story and her own assets and her own capabilities, and the kind of levels of anxiety that she may or may not have and the kind of support she may or may not have with her partner, start from there and build up. And one of the easiest ways of doing that, really, is by use, the use of a midwife. So you have the same midwife all the way through, and, and after the baby comes, you have a health visitor who then visits you. That doesn't happen anymore, or it happens very, very rarely. So the whole thing has become very heavily managed, like the whole of society, and depersonalized, and that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so... I mean, if we were really going back to scratch, I'd say you talk to a group of several thousand women who've been through the experience and redesign the whole service. And I bet you, in the long run, it would cost far less. The other thing that I think is really quite appalling is that once you've had that baby, the level of support for, ch for children, for child health in this country, is one of the worst in Western Europe. Children die in this country of, of illnesses they really have no business dying from. And you have children, you only have, th with children with asthma, only 3% have a health plan, which seems to me ridiculous um, in, a, in a 21st century economy. So um, I think, yeah, we should redesign. And I think, um, I think that would answer your question about variations in, in between countries. Mm -hmm. And in terms of it being very, very painful, <coughs> it is quite painful. Um, but... Um, but in a way, that's part of the, a part, you know, well, I, I had, I had my, my last child, I had my first child in St. Thomas's, and it was like a walking traffic jam, I mean, crash. Uh, the second <laughs> one I had at home, and, and it was really quite, quite, quite a wonderful experience without any television cameras, so maybe that was the, that was the reason. Okay, um, yes, I think um, the NHS is terribly risk averse, and I think that's probably because the NHS is so driven by targets and clinical indicators. Um, we don't have time to sit down with each individual woman and go through her own pregnancy and history. And my advice is always, if you want that, book an appointment with a consultant midwife because they are the ones that will spend time with you and your wife and, and talk to you about if you've got concerns and they're the ones that we need to use more often. I would completely redesign the service as well. It's not fit for the 21st century. I would have everybody midwifery back out in the community uh, in the days of call the midwife potentially even because that's where our place is. 
Um, I have come across uh, colleagues uh, in, in units where we have the same organisation, but the uh, interventions that are offered women are completely different premises because people have got, clinicians have got different views on things. And I've also had the experience of going to countries like Brazil where they're still doing routine uh, episiotomies and routine C-sections on women because their women are different. So yes, we have got this real issue about the way we perceive women's health in each country that we go to. Linda? Part of, the reason, part of the reason I wrote my book was because um, I got given this ream of information about health in pregnancy by the NHS and, and I was just like, well, what do I do with this? It's saying basically I can't really do anything and I wanted to know whether if I ate some um, camembert for my dinner, whether I really was going to give my child the stereosis and, and kill it. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of cut through all this and then actually I was really interested in the cross-cultural thing because um, my, my husband's side of the family is French and so I've been to... France a few times when I've been pregnant and and they're not obsessed with cheese at all they you know they think it's a bit weird that we avoid cheese but they 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 won't touch cabbage they're like cab you know <laughs> you can get ill from cabbage <laughs> don't touch the cabbage <laughs> um, and the other thing is is this uncertainty after birth so actually yeah I mean I started writing my book when I was pregnant because I had all these questions about pregnancy and then I thought the book was just going to be about pregnancy and then I had my baby and suddenly again I was like Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm left in this complete vacuum. I don't know how to. I don't. You know, I. No one's giving me any advice at all. Is it normal that this is happening? This is a bit weird. Um, should you know? Everyone else's baby seems to be sleeping. Mine isn't. You know, is, is that rash normal? All this kind of thing. And I, you know, I, so actually I ended up asking a lot more questions about the post birth thing than I did about pregnancy in the end. And then the last thing I was just going to say was about one born every minute. I deliberately didn't watch one born every minute because. I was doing a hypnobirthing course and I'd been told to banish all thoughts of pain and fear and all this kind of thing. <laughs> you know, you have to replace the word pain with, um, with uh, discomfort and contraction as a surge and all this kind of thing. So I was like, I'm not going to watch One Born Every Minute. And I wish I had because it might have given me a more realistic idea of what birth would be about. And so when I ended up asking for an epidural, I didn't like feel that I was failing in some way for doing that. And it's, you know, it's OK to have pain relief. Jenny, very briefly, I'm afraid. Yes, OK, um, two very brief points. Uh, the first is a question to Linda, which is maybe one for the bar. Um, when you mentioned morning sickness um, and why is not more being done about it, I actually thought that was to do with the thalidomide thing. And, I mean, it seems to me that that, that whole kind of obsession with the teratogenic, which I could never say properly, teratogenic effects of, or potential effects of this, that or the other chemical, yeah, has a. I mean, the thal thalidomide tragedy has a lot to answer for mm. in, in that regard. Um, to the point where, I mean, a few years ago, uh, there was a newspaper article about how um, GPs were just not prescribing women medication that they just needed, like for I can't remember whatever conditions they had, because there's this kind of well, we don't know what effect it's going to have on the baby. Then on the rubbish level, you get this kind of rampant epidemiology everywhere, which mm. has to. You know, and it seems to me that I just want to kind of suggest that far from this being a victory for science or, you know, real kind of science in there, there's, there's a retreat from science at one kind of key level about the kind of treatments and interventions that you can use. Um, but instead you have a lot of language of science and, you know, monitoring and surveillance. And that's where I think the scanning thing, I think there is a case to answer because I think there's a lot of measuring and not, not very much looking, you know, and a reliance on technology rather than expertise and professional judgment. Um, finally, on one born every minute, never watched it, too squeamish, um, but it just seems to me that that and the baby on board badges, one thing that I found really disturbing um, is that a lot of pregnancy culture and particularly the obsession with birth seems to be entirely self-obsessed, you know, and for this I blame pregnant women actually, not just the culture, where you just think, God, you know, it's like if you're a complete diva, you might like this whole sort of constantly being looked at and pampered and everything, you know, um, runs counter to the kind of notion of sort of independent modern women, seems to me. But more importantly, um, I find it disturbing because, you know, you've got the rest of the child's life, okay, and this obsession with pregnancy and the birth, which is all about you, you think, well, what about the rest of it? Surely birth is a means to an end, I always thought. The end is the child. And can't we just kind of get over it and start looking at children as children? Well, yeah, can we thank our panel? Thank you very much. Um,